title Immunological Tools and Strategies for Red Wine Making. My name is Arko Bradovic, I'm Market and Development Manager for Narte Specific. This is second webinar in this series. The first one was on a white wine, and today we will cover tools for red wine making. Today's presenters are Miss Ray Chen, and Ray is our an artist, an artist's technical manager, and Mr. Mattia Vajaretti, who is technical manager for our international operation. Um, is a uh, few house rules here. We'll have Q&A time at the end of, of this session. Then maybe refrain and wait till presentation is finished and then then we can talk to each other. Uh, presentation from Mr. Mattia Vajoretti is recorded because of time difference. He won't join us, but he put lots of time and effort in preparing this. Without further ado, I give you Ray Chen and Mattia in presentation titled Onological Tools and Strategies for Red Wine Making. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the second vintage webinar from Anardis. In this webinar, we're focusing on the topic of onological tools and strategies for red wine making. Darko, our um, Anardis specific sales manager, will be the mediator. And joining me this time is Mattia Vairetti, our technical specialist from Anardis Italian department. My name is Ray Chan, and I'm the technical support for Anardis specific. So here are the agenda for this webinar. Um, the content will be divided into three categories based on wine making objectives and steps. First off, microbial protection, where I'll cover the importance of microbial stability and Mattia will discuss on the onological tools for removal of any sort of undesirable microbes. Secondly, color optimization and stability. We'll talk about the different groups of color compounds, the importance of color stability, as well as strategies and tools to maximize the color potential of the variety. And then lastly, we'll touch on fermentation strategies for red wines, um, mainly how the characteristic of yeast strengths impact the sensory and flavor of wine, as well as an artist offers on yeast strengths for red fermentation and nutrient management. First off, we're going to touch on microbial stability. So microbial stability plays a significant importance in winemaking as there is a broad range of microbes present in the vineyards, cellar, and throughout the winemaking process, but not necessarily all of them are desirable or contribute positive attributes to the wine. So the dominance by a specific species of, or group of organisms at different winemaking stages depends on the microbes present as well as the grape conditions prior to harvest. For the broad range of microbes present in winemaking, we can group them into the three following categories. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, non-saccharomyces, this includes your indigenous yeast ranks and other species of yeast such as um, Candida or Debromyces. And then lastly, uh, spologies and bacteria, which are the groups of microbes undesirable for the purpose of producing a clean wine that is perceived as non faulty. General types of spoilage bacteria found in wines are lactic acid bacteria and acidic acid bacteria. And occasionally you can also find Britannomyces, Bacillus, and Streptomyces. The figure on the left hand side uh, represents the general growth cycle of A, non Saccharomyces um, yeast ranks, B, Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast ranks, C, Oenococcus, which is the commercial malolactic fermentation bacteria strain, and then D, spoilage yeast and bacteria during vinification. So both Saccharomyces and non Saccharomyces yeast strain demonstrate their peak of relative viable population during early fermentation stages, um, namely at most juice stage and during primary fermentation. And the relative viable population of spoilage yeast and bacteria strains tend to start accumulating at mid stage of malolactic fermentation, then continue on throughout the aging process once the population is established. The source of microbial contamination can come from both vineyards and winery. So in the vineyards, any type of physical damage um, to the grapes prior to harvest create entry points for the microbes which are present on the grape skins. These physical damage could be from meteorological events or damage caused by animals and pets such as wasps, moths, birds and mammals. 
For reference, <clears throat> on the right hand side, here's the breakdown of microbes present on grapes. So on a grape skin, you can find yeast, both Saccharomyces and non-Saccharomyces strains, acidic acid bacteria, around 10 to the power of three um, cells per milliliter on healthy grapes, <clears throat> and 10 to the power of six cells per milliliter on rotten grapes. Lactic acid bacteria is also found on grapes with population around 10 to the power of three cells per milliliter. Pathogenic damage in the vineyard also introduced microbial contamination and changing sensory or quality aspect of the juice or wine, and the most common ones being powdery mildew, dana mildew, botrytis neria, and sour rot. In the winery, um, cross-contamination from equipment such as crusher, press, and wood material, um, microbial spoilage factors like fruit flies or human can both be channels for introducing microbial spoilage. Certain winemaking practices also facilitate the spread of microbes such as high juice settling temperature and poor cell hygiene management. In the winery, um, you tend to find a combination of molds, yeast, and bacteria, um, and as lactic acid bacteria and acidic acid bacteria, both ethanol tolerant. Their presence are common throughout the whole winemaking process. So management of microbial contamination relies either on physical techniques such as sorting and temperature control, or by additive to inhibit the growth of certain microbes um, through the addition of either sulfur dioxide, lysozyme, um, sorbic acid, ketosin, or other type of bioprotection. Some alternative techniques are also available, such as um, hydrostatic pressure, pasteurization, or post lye um, irradiation, but obviously there will be a cost factor associated with these sort of techniques. So based on the type and species of microbes, there will be various sort of impact on the wine flavor and quality um, introduced by um, the different species. As a result of bacterial growth, you can expect a dispersion of turbidity in your wine, potentially um, destabilization of other components such as protein and polysaccharides. Carbon dioxide can accompany turbidity and impact the mouthfeel um, either positively or negatively. Microbial growth can also lead to change in pH, which then can lead to loses of color due to anthocyanins and behavior at various pH level. Some microbes can also produce um, glycosidase and metabolites, which can cleave the glycosides residuals from anthocyanins, resulting in um, enhanced precipitation and further loss of color. Off characters, um, either aroma and flavor is also very common as they can be produced either directly by the spoilage microbe, so for example, production of volatile acidity by acidic acid bacteria, or they can be produced by Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast strains um, or MLF bacteria strains due to the presence of other microbes in the media. So for example, the um, occurrence of reductive sulfur aromas by yeast due to stressful fermentation under the presence of other microbes. <clears throat> And then lastly, um, your introduction of negative bioactive characters such as um, ethyl carbamate, biogenic amines, and higher alcohols. Looking to the potential impact on wine flavor and quality by each micro, um, so Saccharomyces um, yeast can introduce turbidity, carbon dioxide, reductive aromas, and a trace level of ethyl carbamate. Zygosaccharomyces can also produce turbidity as a result of the sand-like sediment, as well as carbon dioxide. Britannomyces will create off characters related to volatile phenols and acidic acid. And well yeast and grape flora can also produce undesirable characters like certain groups of e esters, acidic acid, and affect the fermentation kinetics of Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast strain. <clears throat> Bacteria-wise, um, lactic acid bacteria can result in misplaced malolactic fermentation, um, ropiness, which refers to a type of viscosity, uh, volatile sulfur compounds, mousiness, rancid smell, and sometimes the mannitol disease, which refers to a vinegary ester with slight sweetness due to the production of mannitol. Certain um, LAB species can produce elevated level of diacetyl, which can be either a positive or a negative attribute based on the targeted wine style, and they can also increase bitterness due to the interaction with phenolic compounds. For acidic acid bacteria, the major negative impact is associated with the dispersion of turbidity, formation of acidic acid and ethyl acetate, hence um, a high volatile acidity level. And the two less common species of spoilage bacteria can also have detrimental impact on wine quality, <clears throat> as bacillus tend to produce a mousiness character, and then streptomyces impart a soil character to the wines. 
To combat microbial growth, the most common additive used in winery is sulfur dioxide. However, heavy reliance on sulfur is not the best strategy to recommend based on the following reasons. So at juice or mud stage, high sulfur addition will lead to a high total sulfur at time of alcoholic fermentation and malactive fermentation. MLF bacteria strains are specifically susceptible to high sulfur environment and this can lead to potential sluggish fermentation. High sulfur addition in juice can also lead to formation of reductive sulfur aromas in primary fermentation. And at the wine stage, a common practice for winemakers is to add sulfur right away once malolactic fermentation is completed in order to prevent formation of biogenic amines, contamination from the spoilage bacteria, as well as oxidation. However, based on our research trials, which show on the right hand side, it is found that um, after the complete depletion of malic acid, high concentration of carbonyl compounds such as acetaldehydes and ketoglutaric acids will continue to be produced for another one or two weeks. So these compounds readily bind with sulfur, leading to a higher amount of total sulfur needed to achieve desirable level of microbial protection. Hence, we recommend to use alternative protection during this period of time and delay the addition of sulfur for one or two weeks. High sulfur can also give a rancid smell and reduce the intensity of fruitiness on the nose. And there is also the factor of compliance and legal limit on the maximum allowable addition rate to consider. So what are the alternatives for microbial control uh, other than sulfur? And Mattia will take on from here now and explain to you on some of the products we offer for microbial control and for using low sulfur winemaking as well. Thank you, Ray, for this introduction in um, microbial control and uh, microbes uh, contamination. My name is Mattia Vairetti, as I said, I'm uh, an artist uh, technical uh, support. Today, I will talk about uh, a way how to manage uh, the, the contamination of microbes in, in the wine and in the juice. Specifically, we'll talk about ketosan and uh, the an artist tool uh, with ketosan inside that is an artist time micro m then uh, i will talk about a specific enzyme called an, an artist zim easy filter that can uh, manage the effect of the contamination of uh, botrytis what is uh, an artist stem micro m an artist stem micro m is a product made of pre-activated ketosan and uh, his stars, his stars rich in ketine glucan. Uh, why pre-activated ketosan and what that means? Pre-activated ketosan, it is a ketosan extract from a fungus, Aspergillus niger, that uh, has been treated in a way to have more surface to act against microbes, in 10 times more surface than regular ketosan, with more activated, with more positive charge. So with more charge, so with more energy, with, it is more powerful. Why it is a, a ketosan coming from a fungus, so coming from Aspergillus niger, you know, from uh, Tostachian? Because the ketosan from Tostachian is uh, allergenic, contains uh, such amount of protein that can be dangerous for uh, human health. So that's why we extract the ketosan from uh, fungus. So this blend between pre-activated ketosan and uh, stars, uh, it is designed to work in presence of turbidity. So for example, if uh, I use a pure pre-activated ketosan in the juice and uh, not in the wine, and juice is rich in turbidity, turbidity is made of uh, basically two different things, as you know, one, Part of turbidity is coming from, from the grapes, so from the vegetal soil, so it, it's the cellulose, it's pectins, uh, and solid particles from skins, uh, and uh, it could be also uh, polysaccharides, I mean, anything coming from the grapes, and the other part coming from the microorganism, so it's yeast and bacteria, basically, and, and mold. So that part of uh, yeast cells, uh, is going to react uh, with the vegetal part. So this is specifically designed to have a part that will react with the with the um, with the turbidity coming from the grapes, and the other part, so the pre-activated ketosan, is going to react straight uh, with the microorganism. So with yeast, 
and bacteria and mold. Otherwise, if it will be 100% uh, ketosan pre-activated ketosan, it will work. My, we will waste a part of this uh, uh, activity. Let's have a look to some applications, how we can uh, use and when we can use uh, some micro M. So as microbiological control is the main, uh, is the main uh, activity of uh, this product. Uh, and it is, as we said already, to control uh, wild yeast and bacteria, and uh, also to manage uh, malolactic fermentation. Wild yeast and bacteria, because uh, as Rex said before, uh, in the juice, in the graves, there is uh, a huge population of uh, wild yeast uh, and of Lactobacillus lactobacillus already from the nature. So we want to control them, to dominate them, and we want that our fermentation is clean and it is made only from selected yeast, so from our Saccharomyces cerevidus or Bayanus or Torula or just the selected yeast. Malolactic fermentation control, the reason is the same because ketosan, uh, the micro M, it will kill all the bacteria inside uh, our juice. So if we don't want the malolactic to happen, we just use um, uh, stomach that will kill everything and stop everything. And later on, I can inoculate with a selected uh, enococcus in, uh, in my wine. Then it has a very important side activities. First of all, antioxidant application, the antiox antioxidant activity. The micro M can chelate uh, uh, metals. Metals catalyze oxidation, and uh, if we remove metals, we will have uh, way less uh, oxidative process uh, during the the wine making um, the wine making steps, the vinification. Then uh, it can react also with the specific enzyme that we will see in the next uh, slides. Another uh, side activity that we could see using uh, some micro M and ketosan in general in these few years of application is an aromatic cleanless. So what it does, it can prevent reduction. It can remove uh, even some uh, compounds that gives the reduction um, of flavors. Then because of this antioxidant uh, effect, uh, it can preserve the original aromas uh, from, the, from the grape. As we said, uh, microbial uh, control, uh, the advantages of the winemaking techniques, how we can apply it is, uh, so I kill uh, my bacteria, I kill, uh, uh, wild yeast, I have a clean fermentation. What that means, I can use uh, less sulfur in the beginning. So in the end, I will have less total sulfur in the wine. And that uh, is an uh, important plus. Then I can keep my volatile acidity lower uh, just one just to, to show you an example for uh, in um, Valpolicella in Italy are already a few years that we are using it uh, also for Amarone and for all the kind of wines with a high sugar level. Why? Because we could see that volatile acidity specifically in Amarone but also in other kind of wine with uh, rich in sugars and so in, in alcohol in the end, the volatile acidity was high like 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.9. And uh, using uh, 10 grams per hectoliter of some micro M at tank filling, we could uh, um, have a volatile acidity around 0 0.4, 0 0.5, so half. That is a good su success. And most of the wineries uh, in that area now are using in their protocol 10 grams per hectoliter of some micro M in fermentation. Then help selected is domination and the wild fermentation, natural wine. These two concepts can go together, very easy to, to understand because if uh, I use uh, uh, ketosan in the beginning, uh, as I said already, I kill everything else that is not Saccharomyces cerevisiae or Torula or Bayanus. So the fermentation will be cleaner and the life for our yeast will be easier and specifically for wild fermentation that we are not going to inoculate. So only the best yeast from the skins uh, grapes uh, has to survive and it helps uh, to, 
to go through all the fermentation in a clean way. Then uh, uh, malolactic fermentation management, uh, red control, uh, ketosan, it was developed a few years ago, many years ago, big, to control breath. Then uh, we, we figure out different applications as well. But in the beginning, it was just control breath because it's very efficient breath. Avoid stack fermentation and also in the sparkling um, wine uh, to manage the, the pied de cuve exactly for the same reason because it's helping, uh, it's helping the um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae to lead the fermentation and don't have any contamination inside the pure cube. Here in this arrow, we have uh, more or less uh, an uh, indication to which is the yeast uh, more resistant to ketosan and which is the microbe that is more sensitive to ketosan. As we can see, Pediococcus, Enococcus, Brett, and molds like Botrytis are very sensitive, Lactobacillus. Zygosaccharomyces schizo are still very sensitive. Acetobacter, it is quite sensitive. We can really destroy a population of acetobacter, increasing the dosage. Thorola and Saccharomyces are resistant. I want to show you some data about it, about uh, bacteria in this case. Uh, as you can see, the population, the control is uh, high. Uh, in uh, yeast uh, cells uh, per milliliter is very high. Using uh, 5 or 10 gram of, um, of some micro -M, we could uh, almost kill all the population in Lactobacillus and in Pediococcus. In Acetobacter, we need to increase the dosage, but still we can uh, dominate the, the population. And uh, as Ray showed you before, uh, we can put the, the population below that uh, risky level of uh, cells per milliliter. An artist on micro M has to remove uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae competitors during fermentation. Okay. This is another example of a fermentation. Uh, this happens every year, Emma. This is from 2019. In Spain, also this year, I have a few calls because of stack fermentation. What happened? Happened that uh, around the 15, 20 days of fermentation, the fermentation starts slow, and uh, the risk is that it can stop totally stop, and then to restart it is hard, it's not so so easy. Using uh, um, 10 grams uh, here as well of the micro M, 10 gram per hectoliter. We could the fermentation restarted. Why? Because that means that there was something inside, like a competitor, a wild yeast, a bacteria, or even high level of metal, or I don't know what, some uh, uh, contamination. And the micro M is able to remove it, uh, kill it, uh, and uh, clean the environment, uh, the juice environment, uh, so the, the saccharomyces can lead the fermentation and finish it. Another suggestion that I want to, to give you, my experience uh, using the micro M, uh, it is a great tool, but if after 24 hours of the addition of the micro M, I add a nutrition um, rich in sterols, so in fatty acids and thiamine and vitamins in general, helps even more uh, uh, to keep going the fermentation, depending how bad is this sluggish fermentation. Then uh, let's talk about the side activity, antioxidant application. I will be quick. Uh, basically, what it does, it removes metals. We, we see. So there are two ways of uh, uh, oxidation, enzymatic oxidation and the chemical oxidation. Enzymatic, uh, oxidation. Um, in this case, uh, two enzymes that are dangerous for uh, our juice, uh, for the oxidative process, are lactase and tyrosinase. Lactase and tyrosinase are made also of, with uh, metals, copper specifically. If we remove uh, copper, we can inactivate those enzymes and kill them, basically. So this is one way to uh, reduce the activity of uh, Lacase and tyrosinase. Plus, uh, lacase uh, is an enzyme that is uh, environment uh, with low pH, pH 
50.5 have a, it can has also a positive the positive charge of the protein but also a negative uh, charge so it has a part of positive a part of negative charge a ketosan has a strong a positive charge what it does it can chelate also the lactase it can link the lactase to itself and drop it and take it down so it has a double activities against uh, lacase and again this enzymatic oxidation. Then chemical oxidation, uh, again, removing metals, metals catalyze the chemical oxidation. So they, 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 they the polyphenol become, uh, um, uh, become radicals uh, uh, to become quinones, so they need iron mainly iron, also copper and mainly iron. If we reduce the amount of iron, iron available, also this oxida oxidative process will go way slower. Some data about it. This is an, a trial. So uh, this wine was uh, added with the lacase. What happened? Strong uh, oxidation. You could see the yellow color, the 420, four hours after the addition of lactase was 67% uh, higher. Same with the addition of lactase, but with the 20 gram hectoliter of uh, some microns, we, uh, we had only 39% of increasing of yellow. Loss on red, minus five in the control, minus three of loss of red color in uh, in the in the sample with the stomach one. This is an example of removing metals in uh, fermentation. Uh, this is from this year in Italy. Grapes was Erba Luce and was done in Piemonte, the high Piemonte in Gattinara. So we could see in the blue, we have uh, the, the juice fermented with uh, uh, 10 gram hectoliter micro M in inoculation, added in inoculation. In red, some, uh, 10 gram hectoliter of some micro M added at one third of fermentation. Looking at the number in this table on the right, we see the control in the beginning as, uh, no, the control, sorry, in the end of fermentation, the, the tank that fermented without any addition, at uh, uh, 0 0.85 ppm of iron. 1.2 of uh, copper and uh, 0.57 of aluminium. If you look at the number below, both the, the trials, the micro M at inoculation, the micro M at one third of fermentation, the numbers are uh, way, way uh, lower. Uh, iron is close to zero, copper is uh, 50% less at one third of fermentation and, ten, and five times less uh, at uh, the inoculation. Aluminium uh, as well the, is uh, half. What I want to say, this example, I want to show this example, of course, because the results are very good. Mm, in fermentation, uh, using ketosan remove metals, using it in fermentation is more efficient than to use it in wine. In wine, we could see good results, but way less, like. Uh, 20% less uh, of reduction of, um, of metals. Then cleanless, uh, this is another trial. Generally speaking, uh, ketosan and estals, uh, they absorb, uh, they remove uh, of flavors. They're not uh, the, um, the main tool uh, to fix this problem, but still, uh, if you are using it also for other reasons, you could see effects also in terms of, uh, of flavors um, uh, removing. In this case, is uh, with the reduction, we have H2S. We couldn't see any effect, a good effect with H2S. With the uh, Mercaptan, yes. Uh, ketosan and the stars could remove uh, um, part of the, the Mercaptan of the dimethyl sulfur. What I want to say is this is not the cure, but it does uh, this uh, reduction of, of flavors as well. Just to finish uh, uh, talking about uh, ketosan and some micro M, just a couple of words about the application. So when to add it and how and which dosage. 
tank filling, my suggestion, even earlier, if you want in the crusher, there is that good part of the product. Tank filling, you will have all uh, your uh, stramicron inside to lead your fermentation clean and nice till the end. And to manage uh, malolactic after, uh, so in the end of the alcoholic fermentation. So you can have, uh, for example, that window between alcoholic fermentation and malolactic where you can use a micro to to stabilize your color, for example. You can use it also later on during the aging and to avoid any kind of contamination that can happen from acetobacter or wild yeast that are in the cell. Uh, Narcis uh, Easy Filter, this is an enzyme, is a liquid enzyme. And uh, it is uh, very strong uh, in uh, beta-glucanase activity. It is, a, and, uh, it is a pectolytic enzyme with a very strong beta-glucanase activity. Then uh, it has also an um, important secondary activity, like uh, acetylase and uh, protease. Why I'm talking about it uh, in fermentation for red wine? Because uh, botrytis uh, sometimes happen uh, in specific uh, in some humid uh, race uh, and uh, or maybe some rainy season you have uh, botrytis infection and then we know that uh, the glucans from botrytis can uh, make our uh, filtration not so easy and it's a very expen expensive to change the filters uh, or just to recover them so um, an artist uh, zim easy filter added in the right in the right time uh, help you to fix the problem since the beginning. Then it has other side activities, as we said, can release yeast manoprotein, accelerate the extraction uh, and uh, speed up uh, the, the extraction of the grapes compound, uh, improving wine stability in general because uh, uh, releasing yeast manoproteins, uh, you will increase color stability and also tartaric stability. Let's have a look how it works, how it does work. So um, this is a, a, the, a glucan. It is a glucan and is coming from the histals. In this case, uh, it's not the one from botrytis. This is coming from uh, the histals. See, so if we, there are many links uh, between uh, uh, different glucans. Now, if we are able to stop that, the, the link with 1, 3, 1, 6 plus the 1, 4 beta glucan, and this is uh, specifically from uh, easy filter because 1, 3, 1, 4, uh, 1, 3, 1, 6 beta glucans, no problem. 1, 4, 12, also the 1, 4 uh, is, is not so easy. So if you can cut also the, these, uh, these links, uh, we can release monoproteins because as you can see in the picture on the right, and we can destroy the, the glucan that can be a, a problem that can give us issues during the filtrability later on. Uh, the application, as we said, in, uh, in grapes with uh, botrytis. Important tips is uh, if we have uh, a grapes effect of botrytis, uh, be careful to add it once the fermentation started. Why? Because uh, uh, the, um, the, this enzyme can chop, can cut in very little pieces our, uh, our polyphen also histals and the risk that we can um, make uh, oxidation, uh, oxidative process easier. So we wait till the fermentation start, then we add the, the easy filter. So we avoid to the lack case to oxidize our, um, our juice. If the, the grapes is healthy, uh, we can add it in the maceration uh, combined with another um, cellulase or hemicellulase uh, uh, enzyme. What it does, it can increase the spectrum of activities of our, um, um, of our uh, cellulasic or hemicellulasic enzyme. Then during fermentation, because it releases monoproteins or so in the press wine to improve the, clarific the clarification, on in the wine in the end. In the wines, what it does uh, is releasing monoproteins. So it speeds up uh, this process uh, of the autolysis of the 
of the of the lease. If we don't have lease or just we want to improve it, we can add some uh, lease uh, from, uh, for example, in this case, our Surly range is a product, uh, is a range with um, e-styles. Just a couple of examples of specific situations. This, this slide is showing uh, press wine. So press wine is uh, always not so easy to manage because it's very turbid, it's very rich in polyphenols and in, it is easy in the press wine to have contamination, microbial contamination. So this is just a tool that uh, has been used uh, in uh, Spain uh, since a couple of years uh, with this filter with great uh, results. So uh, basically there is the addition between two and four milliliter of hectoliter of easy filter as soon as possible to start uh, to, to cut in little particles uh, all the um, polyphenols and all the pectins and um, everything, glucans, uh, cellulose, everything, everything you extract from the from the press. And at the same time, uh, between two and 10 grams per hectolitre of microam to manage the, the contamination. Then uh, um, use uh, micro oxygenation is a mass, not a micro here. Three milligram uh, oxygen liter per day what uh, it does, uh, it can uh, remove any of flavors, strip them out, uh, and at the same time uh, strip also the, the CO2. The CO2 is not helping on the setting. Then uh, add some finding agents and, uh, and rack it off for sensitive. Another example is the thermovinification of application of AZ filter. So, as you can see in this graphic, uh, easy filter helps uh, to speed up uh, the, the settling and uh, the clarification of the wine. If I want to do it quickly, uh, just uh, use uh, five hectoliter of uh, Zim easy filter and, uh, and you just speed it up because it's increasing the spectrum. In the thermovinification, uh, we extract everything from the skins. So we'll have everything from in the in our juice uh, and it's not so easy to, to clarify. And with the Z filter we can stop it. Thank you so much, Matia. That was very informative and it's really good to see some um, trial data from both the product. So uh, I have a question. Um, if I'm to ask that micro M in my juice or wine, what would be the actual seller application steps? But the micro M, as I said, uh, needs to be added or the crusher or tank filling or even later on to remove it uh, is uh, very easy. Just it is a finding agent. You just need to wait the timing of the settling and then wrap it off. You can speed it up this timing with a touch of bento, but if you are not in a hurry and uh, just wait for the settling, uh, it will settle the same time of the of the styles uh, and then uh, rack it off. I see, gotcha. And for the enzyme, so I'm easy filter. So can can it also be used post malolactic fermentation or in barrel storage? Because um, in your presentation slides, we mostly talk about the application during um, crusher or on juice. Uh, yes, of course. Um, specifically for. Uh, the, for the increase the filtrability, as we said, we didn't work it uh, before. We did before. Other ways uh, is strategic for, uh, as uh, we, as I mentioned, as I mentioned before, uh, for uh, the releasing of uh, monoproteins with uh, the e-styles, for example, you do a marconage in the, in the barrel or in the tank, uh, and the easy filter will speed up or will even make it happen, the, the releasing of monoproteins, uh, or you can even add uh, some uh, external uh, monoproteins like uh, e-styles, like uh, so the, our Surly range, as I mentioned before. I see, thank you very much. So now we're moving on to our second topic, um, so which is color optimization and stability. So, color in red wine is contributed by compounds around 0.5% of the wine. 
and the occurrence of color is caused by heterogeneous mixtures of compounds, but generally categorized into three groups. So you have your free anthocyanins, um, your complexes derived from co-pigmentation, and then the polymeric pigments as a result of color condensation. Free anthocyanins depends um, upon pH for coloration. So they're highly colored at a lower pH and turns into colorless forms at a moderate pH. And it is also bleachable by bisulfide. So this form of color is dominant in young red wines and the most dominant form is melvin 3 glucoside. When it comes to color, uh, winemakers look to deliver their wines to customer, which represents pigmentation that is appropriate for the variety in a wine style. Any grape um, will show certain interesting uh, maximum tannin and pigmentation that can be potentially extracted. And the potential is based on several factors. So obviously variety, fruit ripeness, physical conditions of fruit during the growth season, and then handling during a post-harvest. So the graph below demonstrates the approximate relative extraction rates of various components that contribute to the overall red wine color throughout the winemaking process, namely tannins, anthocyanins, and um, to a lower extent polysaccharides as well, as they help promote color stability. As you can see, the extraction rates of anthocyanins are the highest at early stage of red winemaking, namely cold soak and early fermentation, and this is because anthocyanins are rather aqueous soluble, hence easily extracted early during the winemaking stage and can be enhanced by cold soak and or enzymatic treatments. Tannins, which promotes anthocyanin stabilization, are more ethanol soluble, hence better extracted later on during fermentation. At the beginning of fermentation, there is a abundant amount of anthocyanins, but not enough tannins to chemically stabilize it, and therefore anthocyanins can be easily dropped out of solution and lost. The second group of color contributing compounds is derived from co-pigmentation. So anthocyanins can form non-covalent interactions with other cofactors in wines to create such effect, which results in stabilization of the pigmented aromatic forms of anthocyanins and contribute to elevated absorbance of red wines. So the co-pigmentation interactions can be described by the equation represented here, um, and the K is the binding constant of the anthocyanin and the cofactor. So phenolic compounds with uh, planar aromatic structures are the best cofactors, and the formation of these complexes increase the proportion of anthocyanins, which exists in the flavonoid form, which is the red color form. And the chemistry explanation of this reaction is that anthocyanins mostly have positive charges and are electropore, and other phenolic compounds in wines are electron rich, as the phenol groups are electron donors. In addition, when anthocyanin concentration in wine is high, they can also self-associate and result in strong pigmentation as well. And this is also why um, preservation of indigenous phenolic uh, content should be also taken into consideration if winemakers are seeking to maximize color retention. Co-pigmented um, complexes are relatively stable and can persist up to three years in bottles without degradation or precipitation. And the last group of color contributing compounds are the result of anthocyanins reacting with various com uh, compounds in wine matrix to form modified pigments. This reaction is also referred to condensation, and the resulting pigments refer to polymeric uh, pigments. So the wine components can be condensed tannins, acetaldehyde, keto acids, etc. And this is the most stable form of color. So these wine pigments are, um, first of all, less prone to degradation during long-term storage. They absorb more strongly at wine pH and demonstrate less pH dependence in the absorption behavior and they are less bleachable by bisulfides. There are a few forms of the polymeric pigments. Most commonly, we have the anthocyanin tannin adult and tannin anthocyanin adults. So these are formed by electrophilic aromatic substitution on the A ring of a flavonoid, which essentially means that a tannin compound is binding onto an anthocyanin compound. In addition, um, wine oxidation and fermentation can produce relative compound, which modify the anthocyanin in a number of ways to produce new pigments. The most common compound being acetaldehyde, which is a byproduct of yeast sugar metabolism during fermentation. So acetaldehyde acts as an excellent electrophile and acts to bridge two flavonoid A rings. So this can either be um, between two flavonoids, so two tannins, one tannin and one anthocyanin compounds, or two anthocyanin compounds. So these bridge pigments are proven to be way less susceptible to color loss by sulfur addition, water, or other external factors. 
the last class of compounds from condensation reaction is called uh, pyranol anthocyanins, which contains an uh, additional pyrin ring. So, for example, vitamin A is formed by reaction of pure uric acid and melvedin 3 glucoside. So, these are extremely color stable compounds, um, totally resistant to bleaching, even up to 250 milligrams per liter of sulfur and show less than 10% variation in absorbance uh, intensity between pH 2 and pH 4. And as a comparison, free anthocyanins show um, around 40% variance. And these compounds tend to be also more stable over long-term storage. As we've mentioned before, so the amount of potential extractable tannins and pigmentation is based on several factors, and viticulture um, influence plays an important role in determining that level. Varietal differences in color um, is the first one, as the figure on the right bottom hand side um, demonstrates. So the amount of available anthocyanins in a Pretty Verdo or a Shiraz versus a Pinot Noir will be substantially different. Fruit ripeness is also critical, as the major period of um, anthocyanin synthesis in grapes occurs between varaison and harvest. So during this stage, the accumulation is fastest with plentiful sunshine and temperature approximately between 15 to 25 Celsius. Exposure to sunshine and weather condition um, at this ripening stage will be critical for color development and excessive shading from vigorous vegetative growth can reduce the access to sunshine, hence reduce the color formation. The yield will also influence color intensity as yield and beer weight can also alter the skin to pulp ratio. So in order to achieve a maximal potential before harvesting the fruits, these factors shall be taken into consideration. Once the grapes are harvested and crushed, gone through maceration, cold soak either with or without the help of enzymatic activity. Now you have a considerable, uh, considerable amount of free anthocyanins in the media and it's time to consider how to stabilize them. Again, free anthocyanins are easily oxidizable, which can lead to changes in orange or brownish colors and this is an irre uh, irreversible reaction. And it can also sulfur turning into the colorless form. They can also precipitate if bound to any sort of unstable molecules in juice or wine. So as a strategy to combat such, uh, such reaction, you can consider the use of exogenous tannins, either acting as a sacrificial tannin for oxidation prevention and to bind with any sort of um, unstable molecules at maceration or crusher, or to promote condensation reaction and formation of stable polymeric color compounds during early fermentation when low alcohol content is present. As at this stage, there is a high reactivity between the anthocyanins and the tannins, and Mattia will go into the details of the use of exogenous tannins in a minute. And lastly, to touch on the importance of color stability, we need to understand the reaction behind color instability, so which is the precipitation of colloidal color matter. So these are the dark uh, red sediments mainly formed by anthocyanins, tannins, and polysaccharides in wines. Potassium bitartrate crystals can also be found as well, um, precipitated as a result of color colloidal sediments. So any red wine exposed, uh, exposure to low temperature or extended storage time can cause the precipitation of uh, colloidal color matter if the wine is color unstable to start with. In young wines, colloidal complexes are made of anthocyanins, tannins, and polysaccharides. These compounds tend to polymerize and then pass from the soluble state to the colloidal state by forming larger aggregates um, that in time precipitate and form a sediment on the uh, bottom of the bottle. Polymerization is faster in summer, um, feared by high temperature, while color precipitation happens more frequently during winter, feared by low temperature. Wines rich in this colloidal color matter um, are more prone to color precipitations, and these are wines produced from moldy grapes, high temperature fermentation, or strong um, uh, strong mechanical actions. So you're looking at rough crushing, pumping, excessive pump over, stirring leaves, etc. In older red wines, um, colloidal color matter precipitate is mainly caused by tannins that polymerize um, by oxidative condensation. The, the process takes time, um, depending on the quantity of oxygen that can permeate through the cork, and exposure to cold temperature contribute to color, se uh, color sedimentation as well. And on the right, we're showing three different color and stable wines. Uh, first, with a coloring matter sediments. The second one with potassium bitartrate crystal sediments, which are also colored. And the third one with a mixture of both. So color instability even post malolactic fermentation and during storage. 
um, can not only result in a lower level of color intensity in the wine itself, but you can also have a potential risk of introducing sediments and solids in bottled wine, which can be perceived as an undesirable attribute for some customers. So, Mattia, can you take us through the way and um, oenological tools to optimize and stabilize color compounds in red wine? Thanks, Ray, for this uh, refresh in uh, color stability chemistry and not only in the chemistry. That's very useful. And uh, now it'll be more uh, practical. So I will uh, talk about um, the approach uh, during the winemaking process using uh, uh, also uh, an artist tools. So I divided the, the quality in uh, three different uh, steps. Let's call them steps. First one is the extraction of the color from the skins, so the macerative times. Then uh, the tannins, uh, that means uh, to protect this color that I extract and uh, uh, to stabilize it. And in the end, the polysaccharides rich in monoprotein, they will fix this color for a long time. Let's start in talk uh, from this graphic that Ray already mentioned it before. So it's showing in the red uh, is the extraction of anthocyanins, and uh, in the in the brown uh, are the tannins. Of course, the anthocyanins are extracted faster than uh, the tannins from the grapes. What uh, we want to do using an uh, exogenous uh, enzymes, in this case, an uh, Zim Polar Plus, uh, it's a peptolytic enzyme with uh, strong activity in cellulase and hemicellulase. We want to increase the extraction of color and speed it up. And it's not only speed it up because it, we are increasing also the extraction till the end. Uh, we will have more color in the end. But in this, we want to increase and speed up also the extraction of tannins. Why? Why these two things? Of course, because we have more color. We don't want to lose this color uh, by uh, oxidative process, uh, by oxygen. We want to save it. So extracting more tannins, so we have more tannins as sacrificial tannins, so antioxidant that can uh, get up instead of uh, the anthocyanins, as, as Ray said before. And in the same time, uh, more tannins uh, for uh, color stability to fix this color, and also for the texture, for the mouthfeel, and for everything the tannins uh, uh, will do in our wine. An artist uh, tan rouge is a sacrificial tannin that we suggest to add the, the crusher uh, stage before the maceration. Why? Because as you see before in that graphic, uh, I'm back to show you, if I add uh, an artist tan rouge at time zero in the beginning and the crash, the maceration, I will protect my anthocyanins from uh, the oxidation. And at the same time, I can preserve the original tannins from the grapes for the color stability and for the mouthfeel later on. An artist, what is an artist Stan Rouge? Uh, it is a blend of uh, condensate tannins and uh, gallic tannins and the logic tannins. So it is a blend between tannins, gallic and the logic. They will do the sacrificial antioxidant and condensate. They start a little bit to fix the color. So we need to add it as soon as possible to help the our color stability. Then, once uh, we uh, protect uh, our color with these exogenous uh, sacrificial tannins, we need to fix our tannins. So. We suggest uh, we have the, the tannins from the from the graves, then to help them to fix the anthocyanins, uh, we suggest the addition of uh, um, pure monoca monocatechin tannins condensate. It is very, very, very reactive tannins. The name is an artist tannin XC, and you can start uh, straight away since without uh, alcohol in the beginning, uh, let's say the first one or two days, you can. Uh, speed up the co-pigmentation. Then when we will have the alcohol inside the, our juice, we'll have a more uh, acetaldehyde as well. And 
can start also the condensation process uh, with the ethanol bridge between uh, anthocyanin and tannins, stabilizing the, the tannins for long time. In the end, the last step is to fix uh, this, uh, this color, color compounds, because now it's not only an anti free anthocyanin, it's a color compound between uh, anthocyanin and tannins and can be condensate tannins or co pigmentate tannins. What we want to do is uh, try to fix it uh, as, uh, as long as we can during time. The addition of uh, uh, monoproteins or histals is polysaccharides in general uh, help uh, to do it because the monoproteins or polysaccharides go around um, this uh, color compound, fixing it uh, in the timing. In Canto NC, an artist in Canto NC, it is a uh, product uh, that uh, is. Uh, made of blending between yeast polysaccharides and oak tannins. Mainly are uh, tannins extracted from, uh, um, from oak, from French oak. So mainly a logic and a bit of garlic tannins, but uh, what they do, they are antioxidant sacrificial and then can start a little bit the, the color stability. And at the same time, the polysaccharides, what they do, as we said, they fix the color, but they also help in the tartaric stability and they also help in the mouthfeel, they also help in the antioxidant. So this is a very strategic uh, product for uh, fermentation to, to make your life easier. Um, I very like the, the application of this uh, Encanto and C Red. Also for the for the off flavors because it absorbs uh, off flavors, ab absorbs a bit the green character enhancing the original fruit uh, from the wine, fruit aroma from the wine. This is just some data that I wanted to show you. Uh, we compare uh, Incanto C with the uh, oak powder. Basically, Incanto C is an alternative to the chips. We use it of, of chips. So comparing to oak powder, someone is still using uh, oak powder around the world. So we did this comparison. We could see how uh, observation of the color using in Canto NC, that is the, the red uh, the red line, is uh, way higher than the control that is blue and oak powder that is even less than the control, which is the plus in between uh, in Canto powder chips in general uh, to release tannins and polysaccharides for uh, knock powder it takes at three days as you can see in the graphic on the right. With Encanto C you will have your tannins and uh, your polysaccharides available since uh, time zero. So you are protected from the oxygen since the beginning. Again Encanto C range, the one that you saw before, the Encanto C is just one product of our uh, range. We have a kind of Big range of uh, incantancy. I just choose uh, three, the one that I like more. So basically, the different uh, is in the source of the hook, so the source of the tannins, and in the toaster level. Uh, for example, incantancy is quite uh, is a blend between light, medium toasted, and um, high toasted uh, hook. Incantancy share is a bit less toasted, and the source. Uh, is a um, sherry oak tree. So increase even more the fruitness, a bit less the spicy and uh, it's more fresh. And cut and see red is uh, something uh, in the middle uh, because there is uh, also a good amount of high toasted uh, tannins. So just you need to, to know how your wine needs to be and uh, which is your wine making strategy to choose the, the right one. Again, uh, the Encanto is a good tool. Encanto is a good tool to remove that greenish from uh, ripe grapes, but also from unhealthy grapes. Uh, some here maybe a bit moldy or reduction. So it helps to have a clean fermentation, enhancing the aromas plus color stability and uh, the polysaccharides. Just to recap what I said, addition as soon as possible of uh, enzymes, 
to extract color and of tannins, sacrificial tannins as antioxidant. In this case, an artist zinc color plus an artist tan rouge. Then uh, an artist tan see after when when you start to have a bit of alcohol is better. So I put it after the third day. And in Canto, in general, here I put the fourth day, but uh, I can say that I'm not agree 100% in what uh, I put because uh, in Canto and C red and Canto and C general, it's good to add the fourth day in uh, when you already add it, like in this case, a sacrificial planning in, in the beginning. Otherwise, uh, you can add as soon as possible uh, if you don't have any sacrificial ta uh, tanning and the tank field. Careful. Bottom of the of the tank for the full fermentation process. So if you add it uh, time zero, mix the tank, then once the fermentation starts with the pump over, you will suspend it again uh, in solution. Thank you again, Mattia. Um, that was really good information, and I'm sure everyone learned um, something useful from the presentation. Um, just one question. So you didn't mention the addition rights of the various products, and can you just briefly touch point on that? Um, OK, yes. So about uh, tannins, uh, Usually for a tan rouge for sacrificial tanning around 10, 15 grams per hectoliters uh, are enough. And uh, about the tan XC, so monocatechin tannins were around 5, 10 grams per hectoliter, so you can use a bit less uh, dosages. And in Canto and C, generally, depends, of course, in um, which kind of juice uh, you are working. So if it is a white wine, could be also white wine, I suggest a lower dosage, like around 20, 30 grams per hecto. If you have a light red, you can go around 30 uh, as well. If you have a full body wine, uh, like a full body red wine, you can go even up to 50 grams per hectoliter. So depending on uh, what you are working with. Awesome, thank you very much for that. So now, lastly, we're going to look at um, clean and safe alcoholic fermentation. So what sort of considerations to taking to ensuring um, a rapid and um, complete fermentation? So I'll briefly touch on characteristics to consider upon Eastern selection. So these are the factors to evaluate outside of the desired sensory contribution uh, specific e strengths can offer. And they're grouped into either microbial characteristics and analogical characteristics. So for microbial characteristics, um, fermentation temperature, fermentation speed, hence the kinetics, and alcohol tolerance are all critical for red wine making as you want an yeast strain that is more tolerant to a higher temp uh, fermentation temperature and higher potential alcohol without having to face the risk of um, sluggish fermentation. Killer factor would be also critical if you have historically had problem with sluggish or slow fermentation caused by the presence of grape flora or other indigenous strains. Um, analogical characteristics wise, the choice will be based on the style of fermentation. So whether you prefer an aerobic or reductive environment, whether you're considering to co-inoculate a wine or not, and the initial nitrogen and neutron level in the juice, etc. So for commercial yeast strengths, these sort of technical informations are usually available from the supplier. So we recommend to always read through the material and be, be prepared in advance to ensure the best outcome for your um, alcoholic fermentation. When it comes to flavor and sensory contribution, um, as we have mentioned in other webinars as well, this is largely dependent on first the varietal characteristic of the grape itself. Secondly, while making choices in fermentation environment, and then thirdly, impact from an yeast strength based on three major enzymatic activities. So choosing an yeast strength based on your um, dominant enzymatic activities can assist you in tailoring your wine to the desired sensory profile or accentuate the varietal characteristics, allowing the expression to be showcased in its full potential. 
So the first activity, beta glucosidase activity of yeast, focuses on liberating the odorless conjugated terpenes and norsoprenoids in juice to their volatile aromatic forms. So yeast ring with such activity can liberate the sugar ring off the terpenes and norsoprenoids. Terpenes are generally described as fruity and floral, and norsoprenoids in red wines are found to impart petrol woody characters. So a classic example is about polychelical sequel with um, the aromatic grapes, which have high level conjugated um, norsoprenoids, and they impart a tobacco flavor on a wine. And another very common norsoprenoid compound found in most um, of the red variety is beta domestisol, which um, has a pleasant fruity sweet scent. of the yeast ring is acetyltransferase activity, and this relates to the specific activities of nitrogen metabolism in yeast. So certain amino acids can act as aromatic precursors, and yeast rings with this activity is able to converse the free branched amino acids in the cells and then produce esters. So with the presence of an um, alcohol during fermentation, they're able to cut the branched amino acids and release them into the wine. So esters are a large group of fruity and floral compounds present in any sort of wine and grape variety. And with this activity of the yeast ring, it allows the primary fruit profile of the wine to be accentuated. The pool of amino acid acts as precursors is variety dependent, and therefore it's still respectful to the varietal characteristic. You can also choose to supplement exogenous organic nutrients to further utilize this activity. And there are certain nutrients plants which emphasize on amino acids composition that can act as um, aromatic precursors. And the last activity is beta lyse activity. So yeast ring with this activity can either convert the pool of um, cysteine and glutathione precursors into aromatic thiols, which in red wines are commonly described as um, the scent of uh, red currants or gooseberries. Or when you're dealing with any sort of underripe green fruits with high level of C6 green compounds, a yeast ring with a high beta lyse activity alongside with the presence of glutathione or sulfur peptide containing yeast derivatives will be able to shift the C6 compounds into thiolate compounds. So this is very handy for any sort of green fruits as well as varieties such as um, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc and Grenache and these varieties have had high pool of system glutathione precursors. And then now Matthias is going to take on and speak about the Inardis yeast rings we recommend for red wine making. Uh, yes, as uh, Ray said, the, the yeast have these uh, different activities in terms of releasing aromas and not only aromas. The twist that uh, I choose, we choose uh, uh, today are yeast that uh, are kind of balancing between those different activities without uh, overpowering uh, the, the aromas production during fermentation. So it's more in terms of uh, uh, enhance uh, the original aromas from the, from the juice, uh, from the grapes, uh, and at the same time uh, increase the, the complexity. Starting from the first is, is an artist firm uh, WS. This uh, is just to tell you a bit of uh, history. Uh, out uh, this yeast. It was isolated, isolated from a uh, late harvest uh, Zinfandel from uh, uh, California, from Williams uh, Selium Winery. So it is very strong uh, yeast. It can resist to high temperatures and at the same time uh, it can ferment uh, wine uh, up to 17, 18 alcohol uh, degrees, so it has a uh, high alcohol tolerance, uh, uh, low nitrogen needs. Uh, so basically this is a strong yeast that can uh, ferment uh, uh, grapes that uh, grow in the hot places uh, and with a high sugar concentration. It's a very dominant yeast, the fermentation starts very fast. And uh, it is used another application, we talked about it before, is to restart uh, stack fermentation or uh, sluggish fermentation. In terms of aromas, what it does uh, is very respectful of the aromas of the wine, increasing uh, a little bit the, the complexity and uh, enhancing the, the fruit uh, 
of the case. It is uh, used uh, a lot uh, in uh, Zinfandel, of course, it's selected from there, but not only, also in Pinot Noir, uh, but uh, this, uh, this is uh, really is used in a wide uh, spectrum of, uh, of grapes, even, even in white and rosé. It's more used for his uh, be so strong to face fermentation in red, but can be used also in white and rosé wines. Then the second yeast is an artist vintage red. It is more specific. So it is a yeast that was selected producing the old style, old world style red wines um, with a medium and long term aging. What it does as well, uh, enhance the varietal expression and varietal aroma, but it does a touch more of fruitness and uh, spicy, very spicy. So very spicy, it's balanced, the spicy, but enhanced the spicy. It is perfect for Shiraz, it's used a lot uh, with the Shiraz, not only also Cabernet Sauvignon, but uh, a lot uh, with Shiraz uh, because of the spiciness and sweetness uh, together. It is uh, as well uh, strong and uh, resistant uh, yeast can face fermentation up to 16 uh, alcohol degrees uh, and the temperature level in the range between 15 and 32 uh, uh, Celsius degrees. So high temperature uh, uh, also for, uh, for this uh, yeast. I like what Ray said in the beginning that is very important to know the characteristic of our yeast before of the technical characteristic or the analogical characteristic also the nitrogen needs, the volatile acidity production and everything. So we know uh, how we are managing the fermentation grapes. We are not using a random uh, yeast. Another good, uh, good plus of this yeast uh, is the, the production of uh, acetaldehyde. And uh, this acetaldehyde is very, very helpful to have it straight away on color stability for uh, red wine, big body red wine. Then it produce uh, um, quite known, well known because it produce a lot of glycerol and they release a lot of monoproteins. So they are perfect for uh, wine that need to be aged for a medium or long, uh, long term. So gives body and helps also in, in stability because as we said, in color and the tartaric stability. Just a couple of words about this nutrition that is very, very important to give the right this nutrition in terms of uh, yarn. So we need to go through the full fermentation. If the yarn is too low, my yeast needs uh, uh, nitrogen to face the fermentation, not only nitrogen, nitrogen also vitamins and thiamine uh, minerals, uh, etc. So uh, here I'm showing two different uh, nutrients, Nutrifer Energy and Nutrifer Maron Plus. And both of them uh, are 100% uh, organic nutrients, uh, um, uh, acids uh, content, 100% amino acid contents. So the energy is uh, richer in uh, amino acid, uh, easy to use for the yeast for the fermentation. So give the power straight away the energy to, for the, um, the yeast to finish the fermentation. Nutrifer Maron Plus contains the um, amino acid easy to use for the yeast as a food, but at the same time some uh, amino acid that are uh, aromatic precursors. So the yeast will eat only the nitrogen that it needs and will release the skeleton and this skeleton is a precursor of uh, a uh, superior alcohol and uh, an ester. So depending on how much you want to increase uh, the, and, uh, the, the aroma of, the, of your um, wine, you can choose which one to use. Nutriferm Advance, uh, it is the fuel for yeast development. is a nutrition that we suggest to use uh, after three, four days, so one third of the start of the fermentation. It is uh, uh, made of uh, inactivated yeast, DEP, DAP, and cellulose. 
So what it does, the inactivated yeast and cellulose, they just clean up, uh, so they toxify the, the Jewish environment during fermentation. And at um, the same time, uh, giving a bit of uh, energy that like is step uh, to the um, to our Jewish to, to face the, the fermentation. So it prevents stuck fermentation. Just to recap uh, the, the, the nutrition, this nutrition strategy, beginning time zero, adding uh, amino acid, free amino acid, Nutriferm Energy, Nutriferm Iron Plus, not later on, that's very important because that's the time where when the yeast can absorb the amino acid. Later on, maybe it won't be able anymore because the, there is too much alcohol around and the yeast is protecting itself, closing the doors where the amino acid can absorb, be absorbed in the yeast. Then, after two or three days, the addition of Nutriferm Advance that uh, will clean up the, the environment. We mentioned it uh, before uh, to use uh, for stack fermentation after uh, some micro M because it has these stars and cellulose, they do detoxify flies plus a bit of that. Then uh, we, we are sure that if nothing bad happens, our fermentation will be, will be done uh, soon and clean uh, with a nice uh, results. In the end. Thank you, Mattia. So this concludes um, our presentation part of the webinar. And thank you everyone for the attention. Um, now we'll be jumping on for a live Q&A session. And if you have any questions, um, uh, welcome to start typing in, in the chat box um, on the right hand side of the page. Thank you, Mattia, again um, for your participation. And Thank you everyone for the attention. Sorry, don't be there for the for the questions, but the, the timing is not uh, easy. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, that concludes our presentation, uh, and it was very informative. And again, thanks to. Mattia and Ray, uh, Q&A session, then uh, we invite you to give us some questions and uh, it can be now or anytime, please contact us anytime and we can be of assistance. Um, lots of time we got a minute or two while we're waiting while people type questions. I just wanted to mention again that uh, since Ray joined us, we got a laboratory in Melbourne that's there for you to use uh, free of charge. We do lots of analysis that can be quite helpful or of assistance to you. Then routinely Ray does um, cold stability, when I say cold stability, it's calcium, tartrate, and potassium by tartrate stability. But there was work with new types of bentonite and their effect on um, yeah, general stability. We also got the ability to do metals and many other things can be discussed. Color stability can be discussed with Ray and uh, we'll endeavor to help with any analysis. Uh, let's go to back to Q and A. Uh, I'll read question that arrived, and then we'll uh, try to answer between Ray and I. The first question is: To improve your color stability in high tannic varieties, what are some alternatives other than adding more tannin? This is low color, high tannic nebbiolo. And Johnny says, grazie. Um, Ray, can I try this one? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Then, hey, I mean, Ray and Mattia went extensively to tannins. There are enzymes that can help. Um, there are different types of tannins. There are polysaccharides. But one thing that 
I spend lots of time on, and then maybe we will talk on another product, is gamma rabic. If you got Kali uh, Teniki Nebbiolo, I would try to fix color with the gamma rabic. There are different gamma rabics, and some don't have any effect on, on color, but we got a product called Mexigam, and I believe lots of you are uh, familiar with that. Mexigam can be added in fermentation. Mexigam can be added after MLF, before cold stabilizing in areas that cold stabilize reds, um, or can be added just prior to bottling. In any stage, Mexigam or Gamma Arabic can provide color stabilizing effect. Then, apart from tannins, apart from usual suspects, gums. And not any gum in case of an artist that's Mexican. Uh, Ray, do you have any more suggestions? Or? Yeah, just to um, add on that. So if you're having um, a high tannic variety, so you already have a bound amount of um, grape tannins or the monocatechins to start with, then I'll say the um, emphasis will be on extracting as much um, anthocyanins up front um, instead of um, looking at like exogenous tannins to promote the condensation later on. So obviously the maceration enzymes will allow you to um, fully extract the potential of the amount of like free anthocyanins you have available in the skins. And then also the exogenous tannins at um, crusher stage, so the sacrificial tannin, um, I'll say it's also a very handy tool because um, with the exogenous tannin as they act as um, like a, for the sacrificial purpose, they can bind to other um, unstable compounds at G stage. So then the free endocyanin that you've already extracted um, won't be lost before they can have any sort of um, condensation or copigmentation reaction during the fermentation. Yeah. But that again fits in adding more tannins, but if uh, yeah, why make it against that then yeah. Uh, gums and I would say yeast polysaccharides. Yeast polysaccharides will capture that color but not add more tannic sensation. Um, I'm not sure that we have any more questions. Uh, I think that's the only question we have for now. Uh, uh, Somebody is typing. Yeah. No worries. Then, yeah, I mean, I'll just go, I'll just go back to an artist tab micro M. An artist tab micro M is um, something that's true alternative to using sulfur dioxide. And maybe in this presentation, we didn't, we didn't emphasize, emphasize enough that it is a tool to achieve a low level of SO2 and high level of free SO2, then it's a portion of SO2 that we add truly can be lowered and an artist said micro will do that mop up of wild microflora and uh, with few suggestions that we had here can be achieved really low level of SO2, high level of free SO2. Uh, that's that. Uh, I can't see any other question, Ray. Not from my side. Um, uh, if there is any other additional question later on, feel free to uh, reach out to us um, through email and I'll make sure to address any sort of questions you have. All right, then maybe we thank everyone. Thank you very much for attending this. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Matia. Uh, and I'll just say again, at any stage, if you have a question and in any stage you need help with your wine, please contact either of us at an artist, but Ray will uh, be able to do lots of analysis and help you with some analytical data. Until then, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.